Today, Take on the South explores the enduringly important question of higher education in both the South and the nation at large. What are the origins of higher education? Who were the key figures in its invention and subsequent entrenchment? What role did the South play in any of this? And who better to help us understand the history than Michael T. Benson, who is both President and Professor of History at Coastal Carolina University. He has held faculty and administrative appointments at a number of universities, including the University of Utah, the University of Notre Dame, and Johns Hopkins University. Dr. Benson earned his doctorate in modern history from the University of Oxford, St. Anthony's College, and he has published a number of books on higher education, including College for the Commonwealth, A Case of Higher Education in American Democracy, and importantly, most recently, and also the access point to today's podcast, he has just published Daniel Coit Gilman and the Birth of the American Modern American University Research University, and that was published by Johns Hopkins University Press in 2022. As Mike explains in this fascinating book, Daniel Coit Gilman was one of the most remarkable education leaders of the late 19th century and the creator of the Modern American Research University. Mike, welcome to the program. Thank you very much, Martin. Great to be here. Your book is fascinating, and I want to obviously talk about it, but you're an interesting person too. <laughs> so I, what I'd like you to do is just introduce yourself. I mean, you're a, a college president, and you teach, and you do a bunch of other stuff. Um, <laughs> where are you from, Mike? Well, I grew up in uh, Texas. Uh, Spent a lot of time out in Utah, but I think the most formative years were spent overseas. I spent three years in England, yep. uh, two years in Italy, and about a year and a half in Israel. So those were all during my 20s, and that really shaped my worldview and my perspective in, a, in a, I think, a very meaningful sort of way. Was that a deliberate choice to go? It was. Well, two years in, on a on a LDS church mission. Uh, and you have no cho- choice as to where they send you. So, sure. but I got a really good draw. Yeah, you did, didn't you? Yeah, <laughs> not bad. Not bad. I was in Rome for a long time, and then uh, my doctorate in Middle Eastern history or Middle Eastern focus of, of my program was spent over there. So I'd spend the school year in England and then the summertime over in, in Israel. So, so you're in your twenties. You've been traveling around Europe, and then you come back. Is that right? I did. I, um, my first job was raising money at the University of Utah, and then I became the, uh, the assistant of the president. I had gone to BYU, uh, also in Utah, uh, as the youngest of six kids. It was kind of the mm-hmm. expectation that I'd go there, even though I had offers to do other things. But I enjoyed my time there. Uh, played basketball at Oxford, which was uh, earned a blue, which was great fun. And then you play with somebody quite famous. I, uh, Corey Booker was a teammate of mine. Uh, was he any good? Yeah, he was very good. Corey <laughs> played tight end at Stanford, and uh, okay. so he's very athletic. But we had a great. We, our team was full of Rhodes Scholars, and I was not. I was a Rotary Scholar, and I joke, Mark, if I say it fast, it sounds like I was a Rhodes Scholar. I was a Rhodes <laughs> Scholar. Very good. Very good. <laughs> um, and then, I mean, and you're still very active. Right? I mean, you run marathons. Is that correct? Yeah, it was a, that's my marathon days are behind me. But uh, I went to Orange Theory early this morning uh, here in Columbia. Uh. And, and I like to golf. Uh, my kid, I have five children, and they keep me very active. I, I, I'm just listening to you, and I can't imagine how much work it is to be a university president. <laughs> and you teach, is that correct? I do. I've taught everywhere I've been, and I think it's. And you and I talked about this beforehand. It keeps you grounded and in touch with students in a way that you just can't get walking about campus. Yeah. Unless so. until you get in the classroom and you hear directly from them, administrators are completely. I mean, th- there's a void if they don't have that experience. Yeah, and in a way, I mean, you're kind of living your research, right? Because your research is focused on, you know, research universities and the expansion of higher education, and you're living it, you're doing it. Because, correct me if I'm wrong, there has always been this association between administering a university and also teaching, right? I mean, that's that's what makes it a university, isn't it? And that was one thing that really attracted me to Gilman, and I know we'll get to him, but... Um, when he left the university after 25 years, uh, and I'll talk about this in my lecture today, um, the university sent out and, and requested of all the graduates to send a little note card with their name, the year they graduated from Hopkins, and where they were. Uh-huh. And over 1,200 responded. Well, I know. And they gave them this beautiful gilded book that had each one of these placards in there. Uh-huh. And he was so moved by it because so many of those students he had taught 
because he taught every semester as well. Uh -huh. And he, he had a tremendous impact on the curriculum that they developed at Hopkins, which of course was started as a graduate school, but then morphed into some, you know, taking undergraduate students. But the relationship he had with his students was really inspiring to me. Mm -hmm. And I really tried to emulate that. Yeah, I can see that. I can see exactly how that's working. So tell us about um, who was Daniel Coy Gilman? So grew up in Norwich, Connecticut, kind of a real Brahmin background. Mm -hmm. uh, his father was an, a, a mercantilist and, and pretty well off. Um, his parents went to Europe uh, much more frequently than one might expect people in the early part of the 19th century. So after he finished at Yale in 1852, uh -huh. he literally bopped around Europe for two years. And when I say bop, that's, that's not a nice way to put it because he had a very focused idea of what he wanted to do. Uh -huh. He was going to go over there and study universities, particularly the British and the, and the German models. Right. He did work for the attache in Russia. Okay. So he did have a job that kind of kept him grounded, but he literally traveled the world and kept these very detailed diaries. And when he returned back to Yale, he had different jobs. They had a Sheffield Scientific School. Back in those days, they really kept the liberal arts apart from what they may call the, the, the technical programs. And so they, they created these technical uh, scientific schools um, at Harvard it was Lawrence at Yale it was the Sheffield School he ran that he was a librarian and then in 1872 he was presented the opportunity to become the third president of the University of California so he spent his entire life on the eastern sea coast mm -hmm. he goes out west and uh, I think he runs headlong into a very different sort of uh, environment California was still very much I mean, he had only been in the state since 1850 right and ran into the Grange, uh, people that really wanted an emphasis on agricultural and agricultural arts mm -hmm. and uh, mechanical arts, as they call them. And I, when the opportunity presented itself to, he had a, a really good friend, Andrew Dixon White, he was the president of Cornell. And he told him about this opportunity, this man named Johns Hopkins, a very unusual name. Mm -hmm. Johns was his great, great grandmother's maternal name. Right. And that was how it, it, the people sometimes forget that S. And it's very important to put that S on their sure, John's options. Sure. So anyway, the, the, this gift of $7 million in 1869 was, I mean, heretofore, no one had ever seen anything like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was really intrigued by the opportunity. And the rest, as they say, is history. He left California in 1875 and took up this responsibility and created the first research university in America. So is it... What made you, the title of your book is um, Modern Research University. What made it modern, Mike? Well, up to that point, if you had a, a, a school like a Harvard or a Yale or a Dartmouth, if they wanted to start a graduate program, they just took kind of the undergraduate mo model and then just kind of topped it off with a few graduate programs. There wasn't an emphasis on primary research. There wasn't really an, a, an emphasis on applying that research uh, to society or producing uh, manuals or, or publications that would disseminate what was going on mm -hmm. with, among your faculty. So if, if you looked at the, when the AAU was established, and he was one of five original founding members of the AAU in 1900, 1900 they took the PhD requirements from Hopkins uh -huh. and basically cod codified them as the PhD requirements for all of America. So the use of external examiners, uh -huh. the length of time between an undergraduate degree and a, and a graduate degree, the publication of theses or di uh, dissertations. This is one of my favorite stories. John Dewey, yeah. the great reformer, does a, a PhD dissertation in 18, I think 1886 on Immanuel Kant, and they lost it. <laughs> so he said, we're not gonna do that again. We're gonna publish every single dissertation, and we're gonna make 100 copies and send them to libraries all over the United States. So it was, it was, in effect, kind of the precursor to interlibrary loans. Yes. Yeah. And um, I mean, all these things had never been done before. Oh, and I, I left out the most important, fellowships. So they offered $500 and, in effect, bought every smart, <laughs> capable undergraduate, you know, recent graduate, and said, come to Hopkins. You don't have to worry about work. You focus primarily on study. And as he said, you become especially good in your directed area. So all these things that we take for granted today, even the duration of a degree, right? I mean, it's just, we think of it as naturalizer, four yeah. or five years, what have you. The distinction between undergraduate and graduate, uh, dissertations being published, fellowships. These things are 
so common that we just assume they've always been around. Mm. <laughs> and you're telling me that Gilman is really the inventor of this, right? With others too, obviously, but without him, it wouldn't look like it does today, right? The American University as we know it today is in form and function a direct result of what he and the board, because the board was behind him 110%, mm -hmm. uh, what they created in Baltimore in 1876. And you know, the genesis of the book was, I read his inaugural address. You know, I've given four different inaugural addresses through yep. my presidencies. Right. And after my second one, I thought, I gotta really see what, what a really good inaugural address is all about. Right. So I went through a whole host of you know, more contemporary, older ones. I found his in 1876, Mark, which is the, the gold standard of inaugural addresses. And if you have a chance, your listeners, look it up, because you will come away incredibly inspired by the vision of this man and the board and all of his contemporaries. And he, he, he used a, a beautiful metaphor. He said, we, we cast our bark upon the Patapsco, which is a river that runs around Baltimore. And he said, we have no idea what's gonna happen, but this is the vision we have for the university. When Hopkins celebrated its 125th anniversary, they came up with this beautiful coffee table book. And the editor, Mame Warren, said, we took 12 things that Gilman outlined as aspirational goals. And lo and behold, a quarter and a, and a, a century later, they had achieved each one of them. Remarkable. And I came away after reading that thinking, you know, I don't know if anyone's written a biography of this gentleman, but they better. And I just had the temerity, I guess, and, <laughs> and uh, who's put a thing I could do it. And when I presented it to the Hopkins Press, they said, yes, please do it. How long did it take you to write this book? Well, research and write, should I say? The research really, I began in earnest in 2017. Okay. So at the time I was at, at Eastern Kentucky and um, I just tried to find time after work or in the summertime. Mm -hmm. And I made my initial visit out to the Eisenhower um, library, not Dwight D. It's Milton Eisenhower, who is Dwight D. Eisenhower's brother, who was the president of Hopkins and the library there at Hopkins is named for him. And then I went up to Yale where he had studied a lot of his papers were there. So it took me about two years and then I had an idea of what uh, the flow of the book would be. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I wrote uh, during that year of COVID about 160,000 words in 10 months. So that was a heavy lift, yeah. but you know, every day I'd write the number of words I had done and I kept it on, on note cards. And uh, it, the more it accumulated, I realized I wanted to make sure I had the storyline right. Mm -hmm. So Hopkins recommended a couple of developmental editors for me. And I had one who was superb and he would say, you know, this is a really interesting part of the story, but highlight it here and then circle back to it later. Okay. So that changed kind of the chronology, kind of chronological flow of the book, but I'm so glad I did that. And then uh, the final editing process took a good year, year and a half. But so I would say in kind of the aggregate, probably four years to do the whole thing. I would say it's quite quick for a book, especially for somebody who is managing a lot of other things too. There's a real testimony to your discipline and tenacity on this. Well, I thank, uh, thank you for that. But I also, it took me back to my graduate school days, which I really missed of being a scholar again. Mm -hmm. And uh, trying to, in many ways, lead by example. I mean, we expect a lot of our faculty, you know, we're a teaching institution, but I also tell them you're a better teacher if, you've, if you're current and contemporary in your discipline mm -hmm. and publish, you know, I'm not the best journals, do what you can, but make sure you're, you're, uh, you're current with, with your area of focus. Um, quick aside, I'm just curious about this. Would you say that Gilman was more influenced by the German higher education system or the British one? Or was uh, that a fictitious distinction I'm making? I don't know if it's fictitious as much as it is. He spent kind of equal amounts focused on both. He loved the German emphasis on primary research mm -hmm. and becoming expert in, in a, an area, not just a generalist. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're going to be a physicist, be a physicist and then really do some cutting edge research. He loved the British model of the kind of the seminary, or as they call it, the seminar method or, or the tutorial system. So the amalgam of the two is what really made Hopkins unique because, you know, I have these old historic photographs of uh, Henry Baxter Adams doing yeah. a seminar on political economy. Right. And then these people turn around and do these literally cutting edge theses because they have the the latitude not to worry about how they're going to make ends meet, but they could focus on research and writing. Yeah. And so I, if, if you wanted to be a medical doctor or you want to do a really rigorous PhD though, 
you went to Germany in right. the latter part, the mid to latter part of the 19th century. Yeah. And Hopkins changed all that. It kept a lot of people here. Yeah, yeah, I can imagine that. And then it became a kind of, you know, a beacon for how it should be done here. Mm -hmm. And lots of other universities started to copy Hopkins, right? That first 25 years in existence, Hopkins produced 596 PhDs. Incredible. And Harvard had a 240-year head start on them, uh -huh. and they produced, I think, 300. Wow. So that's not to suggest that it was easy to get a Hopkins PhD. On, on the contrary, no. it was very rigorous. Right. But uh, Charles Elliott, the president of Harvard, said it wasn't until Hopkins kind of upped the ante mm -hmm. that we really got our graduate program into gear. How, how big was Hopkins in, what, I don't know, 1920? How what size was it? 1920, that's a good question. I mean, uh, just roughly. Rough. 1930, I'm just curious about growth and trajectory. Yeah, so when they started with six original faculty, they had no more than you know, 50, 60 students. Right. And then it just, uh, in leaps and bounds, as they started and many more graduate, excuse me, undergraduate students, it really started to grow. So in the, I'd say the mid twenties, they were probably close to a thousand, maybe 1200 students. And what is it today, Mike? Now they have a ton of graduate students. You know, my master's program in liberal arts uh, was most online. Um, and they have probably 8,000 undergrads and double that in, in graduate students. Wow. And this is an interesting statistic. That $7 million investment, uh -huh. that, that investment by Mr. Hopkins in 1869, I looked at their latest audits, financial statements, inclusive ca of capital, their endowment, a $22 billion operation. <laughs> That's remarkable. So talk about a, a wise investment. Yeah, and sure. you know, the, the, the research and development dollars just came up uh, last week or a couple of weeks ago. And for the 44th year in a row, Hopkins leads everybody. They spent $3.4 billion in research and development. Now, a lot of that comes from the Applied Physics Lab. They do a tremendous amount in the health sciences, mm -hmm. but still in all. The number two is the University of San Francisco, University is, of California, San Francisco. Is that right? Um, oh. And there's an issue, if I can, a yeah. side note yeah. to uh, some Southern history. And that's Hugh Tolan, who was a surgeon from Columbia who in 1850 went to Transylvania University to study medicine. Mm -hmm. It was a very capable surgeon here. He packs his family up for the gold rush. They move to California. He puts out a shingle as a doctor in, in San Francisco yeah. and s decides to start his own medical college, Tolan Medical College. So one of the aspirations that Gilman had when he was president of the University of California was to start professional schools, one of which was a medical school. So he approached Dr. Tolan and said, uh, would you consider gifting your college to the University of California? Because this is bigger than just you. Mm -hmm. It's bigger than San Francisco. It serves all the citizens of the state. He kind of hemmed and hawed a little bit because he really liked his name on it. But he finally acquiesced, and he gave it lock, stock, and barrel, the building, and it became the University of California, San Francisco, the well, only health sciences university in the country. Interesting. And thank you for getting me back on the southern track because <laughs> um, we do have to talk about the south. I'm just curious. Was Johns Hopkins Southern? Well, there's ongoing debate. Some would say that, that uh, Maryland is a Southern state. Right. The, if you were to ask Marylanders, they say we're a seaboard state. I mean, they really see themselves as uh, kind of betwixt and between. Sure. Um, I, you know, one of the challenges he faced in populating the faculty was that there were Southern sympathizers after the Civil War right. who didn't want all these Yankees right. you know, coming and, and, and inculcating the youth mm -hmm. with uh, what they saw was uh, kind of anathema to the, the Southern way. So the, he really had a challenge in, in getting his, the initial faculty and then making sure it was very egalitarian and very agnostic in that regard. And um, it, it produced so many great graduates early on. You asked about the 1920s. There was a professor, a sociology professor, who listed the 1,000 top scientists in America. And 230 of them had their degrees from Hopkins. Mm. So it attracted people from all over. Mm -hmm. But initially, Hopkins really wanted to focus on the, the citizens of, of Maryland, kind of the residents of Baltimore. What a footprint, huh? Yeah, I know. I was curious about you know, the southern angle, because you're entirely right. It's set up in the echoes of Reconstruction. Mm -hmm. um, there is this hesitancy among southern universities to have northerners. And, and, but it's such a liminal space, Maryland, yeah. isn't it? So yeah. he's probably having to toggle and mediate all <laughs> sorts of things that you yeah. wouldn't have to do elsewhere. Exactly right. One of, one of the boards, he was on several boards, Gilman was, but he was on the, the Slater Fund board 
for 20 plus years and was eventually the president of that board, which kind of stepped into the void after Reconstruction, after the, the, dis the Freedmen's Bureau was disbanded and really tried his best to help educate uh, the, the freedmen, the freed slaves from in, in the South. And uh, one, of the, one interesting story is he helped single-handedly save William and Mary mm. uh, after the Civil War. He had gone, he was invited down there by President Ewell to s tour the campus and he was so taken by how bad it was uh, that he came back and enlisted the help of his faculty uh, who helped raise money privately to help save William and Mary and the, the state legislature of Virginia finally kind of ponied up they restored the, um, uh, the main building there, uh, named for Sir Christopher Wren, because he was the architect, mm -hmm. and uh, saved it. Mm -hmm. And so he had a real keen interest in what was happening throughout the southern kind of swath mm -hmm. of states, mm -hmm. even though he was up there in Baltimore. And I should mention, he went to California from 1872 to 1875 four different times on a train. And to get there one way is a week, Mm -hmm. And he came back, and he did that constantly because uh, he just was a big believer of, of being out and about and, sure. and trying to influence as many people as he possibly could. Do you happen to know um, when Johns Hopkins was integrated? Uh, yeah, so they had uh, the first African American student. His name was Kelly Miller. Uh, he was there in the 1870s. Mm -hmm. Uh, brilliant man. Uh, they call him the Bard of the Potomac, even though he was a scientist, he was a very good writer. Mm. Uh, came there on a fellowship. Uh, the funding ran out. Uh, it, it, you know, if they wanted to keep him, I think they would have. Mm -hmm. But there was a bifurcation on the board, too, of position of should they admit women and should they admit, admit uh, uh, minority students. And they did not admit their first undergraduate uh, African-American student until the 1940s. Okay, and what yeah. about women? Women, their first class was admitted in 1969. Okay. So it was a long, <laughs> a long time. Yeah. Ironically, three women were daughters of trustees in, at Hopkins in the 1870s, and even they couldn't get into Hopkins. Oh, my goodness. So that I, I touch on in the book, but there was it was clear there was uh, very different opinions on the bo on the book on the board. Excuse me, and I make the point that Hopkins in so many ways let out and was cutting edge, and in these instances they missed it. They really could have been uh, in so many ways even more innovative in terms of who they admitted and the lives they impacted. When did um, when did Gilman pass away? He passed away in 1908. Okay. And he had just come back from Europe. You know, I mentioned how much he loved to travel, but he and his wife and his brother had come back from a, a trip to Europe. And he was up in Norwich, Connecticut, and they went to dinner. Uh, he was getting ready for a family drive around town, his hometown, and he literally just fell over dead. I'll do the math, I'll kind of do the math, but how old was he? Uh, let's see, he was 70, I want to say 72, 73. Okay, so a life well lived. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so at this point, 1908, he set up this amazing university, and it just takes off from the foundations that he laid. Mm -hmm. right? um, much been written on him besides what you've done. No, when I decided to go down this path, Mark, I, I, I did a little research to find out what was out there. Mm -hmm. He wrote uh, several books. He wrote a, a biography of uh, a geography professor that he had at Yale. Uh, he wrote kind of... Um, of his version of memoirs, which were just kind of these little snippets. They were speeches that they compiled. But nobody had ever written anything, you know, mm. cradle to grave uh, for 50, 60 years. And, you know, Abraham Flexner, who was known really for medical education in the United States, wrote something in the 40s, but it's just very small. Yeah. yeah. So I thought that was a cr an incredible disservice to him, yeah. but also to understanding higher education in America. Sure, absolutely, absolutely. Um, let, let's switch gears just a bit here. Um, he so he establishes really the blueprint of higher education excellence, right? Mm. And we can see this today because lots of places copy Johns Hopkins. And they try to anyway because mm -hmm. it's hard to emulate. Um, what do you think he would say if he were alive today about the state of higher education in this country? <laughs> Uh, <laughs> it's always t uh, tough to kind of time travel and, and, and bring him forward or go back. Yeah. Um, he was a very strong advocate for uh, access. Uh, 
he had a daughter who was really um, something. She ran for governor, mayor of Baltimore. She was a, a kind of proclaimed socialist. Mm -hmm. um, she never won any of her, the races that she participated in. Right. Uh, but th the two of them were not that dissimilar in terms of their kind of worldview of education was the great, as Horace Mann said, the great equalizer of the condition mm -hmm. of men. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. access to it meant everything. So he'd probably be quite impressed, right? I think you'd be very impressed with how uh, affordable, on balance, mm -hmm. and accessible American higher education is. And the return on investment. And the return right? on investment. Yeah. I think you'd be a little uh, dismayed to see uh, the intrusion of whatever entity it is, whether it's legislatures or donors or outside people, into the educational process. Because he was a big believer that you let the faculty do their thing. Mm -hmm. You know, you get them the, the, the resources they need and then cut them loose. And um, the creativity that was produced by that early part of Hopkins is testament of his belief in hiring the very best faculty. Get them the, the equipment they need, the lab space, um, and they can, they can work miracles. And I think he would, be, uh, he would probably be encouraged by the support that the federal government over a long arc uh, period of time has done to support education in terms of um, whether it's the National Science Foundation or some of these other government entities and, and the, 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 ingenu the innovation they've helped spur over a long period of time. So because the U.S. higher education system is arguably the preeminent one in the world, right, today. Clark Kerr said it's the greatest education system the world has ever seen. Now, that's not to say we don't have our faults and foibles and we do really stupid stuff, because we do. But if you take it and compare it to other systems, because a lot of people have tried to emulate it. Uh, you know, the PhD programs. And look at all the people that come here to do their mm -hmm. doctoral programs. Sure. Well, well, yeah. I'll, I'll raise my hand. Yeah. You know, I did it. Um, so it's actually a success story, isn't it, mm. higher education in the United States because of people like Gilman, right? Um, let, me, let me ask you to put your presidential cap on right now mm -hmm. and talk about what you think are the principal challenges ahead for higher education in this country. I've been at this for 30 years now. I've been a president for over 20. So I've seen a lot of uh, different cycles. Um, it seems like support for education uh, has, has waned. Uh, I think our country is questioning whether or not it's worth it. And I see it every day. I see it in those, the faces of the first generation college students that come across that stage and know that they've changed the trajectory of their life, mm -hmm. but also everyone that's gonna follow them. Mm -hmm. So I am an ardent believer in our primary focus, which is, is to, to educate well-grounded citizens that can go out and uh, make a difference. Um, a lot of Americans are questioning whether or not it's, it's worth the, the, the excessive cost of tuition and fees. And I'm proud to say, just like the other institutions in South Carolina, we've kept in-state tuition low for the last, stable for the last five years. Yeah, yeah. Now we're getting a lot ton of out-of-state students that want to come to the South, and we talked about this. Right. this is, you know, we may be somewhat inoculated from the, the enrollment cliff that's coming, but we can't take anything for granted because I've learned that students' money is portable, and if they show up on campus and you don't have what they want, they're gonna go somewhere else. I'm glad you brought this up, Mike, this, this so-called demographic cliff. Mm -hmm. um, because I'd like to talk about it briefly in this larger context of higher education. So the, the argument is something like this, and correct me, I'm given a boilerplate summary here, but, um, you know, the financial recession of 2008-2009 led to a decrease in birth rates, mm -hmm. and that's now bubbling through into the number of 18-year-olds that the country has mm -hmm. available go to go to get a degree, mm -hmm. right? And so that should probably start next year or the year after. And the impact is quite significant potentially because it's not just one year, is it? It's at least two, maybe uh, yeah. four, yeah. or maybe eight, yeah. depending on what the demographics are. And we know something about those demographics, don't we? We, we, do. know, we know which states are hit hardest and mm -hmm. what have you. And for listeners who aren't familiar with it, it's a significant thing because universities are kind of tuition driven. Lots of people think that, you know, the state provides most of the money and it doesn't. You know, I mean, I don't know what your budget is at Coastal, but I'm guessing that probably 
10, 11 percent comes from the state, something like that? A little bit more, but uh, as they say, uh, as some state institutions, we're we're state located and not state supported. Right, right. Okay, so it's not, so most of your money comes from tuition, Mm -hmm. right? So that, that's, it's critical that you get students in. All right. South Carolina is one of those net gain states. Mm -hmm. We're plus Mm -hmm. because we are a migration state. People come here and they come here because they like it for various reasons. Um, But the wrinkle for me, and tell me if I'm wrong on this, is that we push around 48, 49% of students who are from out of state. Mm -hmm. And we draw from New Jersey, New York, Mm -hmm. Ohio, and Illinois, Mm -hmm. right? And all of those states have a significant drop in the number of 18-year-olds that they will have in those states. Mm -hmm. So it is possible that we will have fewer students because they have fewer students to export Mm -hmm. to South Mm -hmm. Carolina, which could hit our bottom line. Is, is, Is that accurate? That's as, about as good a summary as I could have provided. You're spot on. Now, what I think is our advantage, okay. uh, a couple of things. Number one, students want to come to the South to go to college. Yep. So if you were to look at the swath of states from, you know, not, maybe Texas, but all the way through the Carolinas, you know, Georgia, Carolina, Alabama, I think Alabama may be close to 65% out of state students now. Oh, so they don't have a cap. We have a cap here, right? Yeah, and North yeah. Carolina has a cap. Okay. Um, well, I uh, this is top of mind for me because I was asked this last week during our testimony before our subcommittee, mm-hmm. our appropriations higher higher education subcommittee, and I said sixty percent of our students are out of state, forty percent in state, and we are representative of the population in Horry County. Uh-huh. We call them trailing parents because the chances are they've come from New Jersey, uh-huh. they've come from Connecticut, they've come from Pennsylvania, and they've come to vacation. And their, their kid, their son or daughter says, man, I love it here. I want to yeah, go to school here. That's right. Then, then we call them trailing parents. Here come the parents right. retiring right. to, to uh, uh, Merle's Inlet yeah. or wherever. Yeah. So if one other little footnote, Mark, to what you said, if you look at the production, uh, production, the number of high school graduates in states over the next 10 years, there are, I think, only 10 or 11 states that have a, an, an increase. Yeah. We're one South of them. Carolina is one of them. Yeah. So yeah. we will go head to head for those in-state students, and I get it. You know, particularly kids in Horry County. They, my children go to Myrtle Beach High School, okay. and they're surrounded by kids that want to go to Clemson, that want to go to USC, right. that maybe want to go to College of Charleston or Furman. We have to compete with that, but we're getting that influx of, from the north of students, and I don't really see that dissipating. If anything, it may impact the enrollments at a Rutgers or a Penn State or someplace else. Because, like it or not, they're, they're, people want to come to a warmer clime for their collegiate experience. Yeah. Now, we can't take that for granted, and we have to make sure we're on top of our game. We have uh, affordable tuition. We have residence halls. We have Wi-Fi that works. Yep. We're safe. All yep. of those sorts of things. Mm-hmm. So uh, I, I would think in, in, the, in the presence of good options, I say the ultimate barometer of how you're doing is that a student, stu- a, a student chooses you. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting you say all this because when I teach my old South class, mm-hmm. I'll begin and say, well, how many people are not from around here? And I put my hand up naturally. <laughs> but a lot of them, I mean, and they're usually from New Jersey yeah. or where have you. And I so, say, okay, I get the push factor yeah. because New Jersey's got, what, 9 million people. Mm-hmm. Uh, they can't teach them all. Rutgers is big, but it's not that big. Yeah. And you've got Princeton, 2,000 people. They, they're going to go elsewhere. Mm-hmm. So I get the push. Then I get the general pull of the South, Mm -hmm. right? But for me, it's the specifics that are interesting. Why South Carolina? They could go to Georgia. And, you know, a lot of Southern states are going to be poaching our students, right? Because some of them are suffering that decline too. They they don't have as robust 18-year-old population as we do. Mm -hmm. And I happen to think you're entirely right. They come in vacation here, especially at Myrtle Beach, right? (laughs) They like it, it's navigable, it's relatively inexpensive, the weather's good, and yeah, I, like, I want to be here. And that makes perfect sense to me. I think we probably need to be very careful about trying to keep the people we have here yeah, and yeah. not being poached by yeah. you know, University of Georgia or Florida or what yeah. have you. That's a good point. And I should add, 25% of our graduates who are from out of state end up staying in South Carolina. And it's if, critical. 
It's critical. And they, and they just fall in love with it. I yeah. mean, we've fallen in love with it. You're not going to get my wife and kids out of South Carolina, I'll tell you that. Well, I mean, I'm still here, and I've been here 30 <laughs> years. I mean, but also it's critical for the kind of not just the intellectual infrastructure of the state, but the economic future of the mm -hmm. state. You want to keep your talent here. Mm -hmm. And I think a good university experience is critical to that. A bad one, people leave. Yep. But if they've enjoyed their university experience at Coastal Carolina or USC, yeah, we'll stay. This mm -hmm. is good. And that way you don't get any drain. Yeah, exactly. Right? Um, Mike, is there anything else you want to tell us about um, Daniel Coy? Gilman, that would be helpful to thinking about the future of higher education in this country. What kind of legacy lessons did he leave for us? Uh, two things. First is that uh, Daniel Coit Gilman, to me, is emblematic of the, the spirit that America had after the Civil War in recognizing that education was the panacea to so much of what we faced. Mm -hmm. Now, I'll, I've used the example of the two critical uh, public policies. Both were born out of conflict. One's the Civil War. In 1862, Abraham Lincoln signs the Morrill Land Grant Act. Uh, Ten weeks after he signs it, we have the Battle of Antietam yep. with 23,000 casualties. Yep. We've never seen anything like it before in our country. Um, fast forward to World War II. You know, 18 days after D-Day, Franklin Roosevelt signs into law on the GI Bill. Mm -hmm. So two different presidents from two different parties but they recognized that the one thing that we could provide, and one was you know, establishing institutions and creating the land grant system that we have. The other was access for people that before the GI Bill, they had no hope whatsoever of going to college. Right. But that was the one thing that we could provide uh, our citizens was access to education. And the, I, to me, those are two transformative policies that have shaped our country uh, for good. What was really amazing that came out of the Hopkins experiment is that you had the, the public institutions that were established, but think about what happened with the private institutions. Right in the wake of, of uh, Hopkins being established, Cornelius Vanderbilt establishes his mm. university. Mm. Clark University, mm. the University of Chicago, yeah. Leland Stanford Jr. University, which was founded by his mother and father for the son that died. And uh, when they couldn't get us uh, recognition at Harvard, they said, we'll go found our own university. Yeah, yeah, uh -huh. And look at Stanford today. Uh, yeah. So the, it, it kind of lit, if you will, this, this fire of philanthropic support that the world had never seen before. And it changed our, our country uh, during the latter part of the 19th century and well into the 20th. So I hope people, I hope they'll enjoy the book, but I hope they'll reflect on a life that uh, really was quite remarkable. And he touched so many uh, areas and causes for good and left a, la a lasting legacy that uh, I really I hope I, I had a I had a blast telling it and I hope people enjoy reading it. Mike Benson, president of Coastal Carolina, professor of history, <laughs> thank you for being on Take on the South. My pleasure, thank you very much Mark. <laughs>